Good evening, and welcome to another edition of What's Happening. I'm Elliot Margolis, and I'm flying solo tonight uh, with a guest that everybody should learn from and understand. It's, he's Joe Schneider running for Congress against Seth Moulton. Joe, welcome to the show. Thank you. Gl glad to be here. Joe, before we get into some real serious questions, tell us a little bit about who you are. Well, going back to the beginning, I was born in Romania, which uh, was a communist dictatorship when, when I grew up. Uh, we were fortunate enough to escape and leave Romania, C came to the United States. A few weeks after I became a U.S. citizen, I entered West Point. I, uh, I was accepted at West Point. And uh, upon graduation from West Point, I was an infantry officer, uh, airborne ranger, and spent most of my career in act, on active duty and in the reserves uh, for 13 years together in special forces, and uh, Green Ber colloquial known as Green Berets. Thereafter, uh, I went uh, to Harvard Business School where I got an MBA. Then I spent a year at the Kennedy School of Government. Uh, and after that, uh, I became an entrepreneur, built a couple of companies, ended up selling one to a division of General Motors, uh, has been on a couple of co corporate boards, I run a consulting operation that advises aerospace and defense companies, as well as the government, on strategy issues. That sounds like you're qualified for Congress. <laughs> uh, I should hope so. Yeah, I, I, it so. It sounds pretty interesting. Now, you just moved to Beverly, correct? Yes, I did. So you live off of Brimble Ave in Beverly. Correct. And you've been here for less than a year? Yes, so less than a year. You've been a Massachusetts year. resident for I, how I, long? I've been a Massachusetts resident since 1977. Oh, okay. Well, so, welcome to Beverly. So I'm a resident of Massachusetts by choice. All right. Well, that's, that's good to hear. Um, have you been a lifelong Republican? I have, although occasionally I've registered as an independent because some communities in Massachusetts, uh, the only uh, election that counts is the Democratic primary. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to participate in uh, political life, uh, you have to register as independent so you can vote in the Democratic primary. But I've been a Republican since 1963 when I was inspired by Barry Goldwater to read his book, Conscience of a Conservative. And uh, I campaigned for him in, in New York City where, where I grew up. And uh, since then, uh, those have been my values of, of being a conservative Republican. Okay, and I was going through your website, and I'm, I'm looking at some of the stuff here. You say, you talk about finding common ground. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at Congress today, their uh, approval rating is down the toilet. Um, and yet, even though it's as bad as it is, somewhere around 10, mm -hmm. 11 percent, about 95 percent of the people running re for re-election get re-elected. Mm -hmm. um, with that in mind, how do you think you're going to do with, against Seth Moulton? Why do you think you're going to pull this off? Mm -hmm. And when you talk about common ground, what does that really mean? Well, let me start with the common ground, and which is uh, probably the principal reason I, I am running, is the fact that American politics have become so divisive and so polarized that we fail to solve the basic problems of our society. And uh, whenever we have an issue, whether it's health care, whether it's immigration, whether it's cost of education, whether it's the criminal justice system, no matter what the issue, the two political parties basically go to their corners and start throwing partisan arrows at each other, when in fact for every issue, you know, let's take violence. 99% of Americans agree that we should not have violence in schools. I can't imagine. I don't know anybody, but there might be someone out there crazy. But instead of saying, how can we reduce violence in schools, we start off with the most divisive aspect of it, that we know we're not going to find immediate common ground. What do we do about the Second Amendment and guns? And we ignore all the other things that we have an agreement on. So if we agree on 80 percent, de develop an 80 percent solution, 
And then we, we deal with the extremes later and try to adjudicate them to the political process, we can move our country forward on, on almost every single issue. So we don't end up, like in healthcare, spending twice as much as any other society, any other civilized society, and getting results as a whole. You know, healthcare system is great for most Americans, but we spend far too much for it. And it doesn't cover everybody. A lot of people are getting marginal health care. Some people avoid health care because of co-pays and things like that. So we don't have a very efficient health care system, yet we fail to solve it, we fail to argue it, to, uh, to resolve it. And we, we have two extremes. Either we have the current health care system or we have something like single payer, which is probably going to be a lot worse than the current system. And there's probably... A, a hundred items on the dial that, that you can change the system to reduce cost and make healthcare universally acceptable. You know, it, it's unthinkable how a society like ours can meet those simple goals. And there are solutions. There are solutions, you know, in business schools and in, in other areas, the solutions in HHS. Yet the political system, because it is divisive and it is polarized, doesn't address that. Okay, but how do you fix it? I mean, you know, if you say, if you look outside today and you see the sky is blue and you're a Republican, a Democrat's going to say, yeah, but look at all the clouds up there. Uh, they're always going to find, w whether it's Democrat or Republican, doesn't matter because they, they fight with each other and they're more concerned about the party than they are about the issues. That's why nothing gets done. How do you fix that? Well, I would argue they're more concerned about power than they are concerned about anything else. They want to maintain their power, and they do almost any professional politicians do almost anything to stay in power. So uh, right now, our political system works, but it only works for special interests that influence the system. It works really well for politicians. You gave the statistics. That's, that's accurate. You know, any business with 11 percent approval rating and 95 percent uh, re-election rate, you say there's, there's a discontinuity there, and it works well for government bureaucrats. In Washington, they don't do anything except pass laws and make regulation. Yet seven of the ten richest counties in America are surrounding Washington, D.C. So they've also learned how to skim off the top from the productivity of the American people to maintain themselves. And the power of the bureaucracy is enormous in Washington. And, it's, and, and I've been on boards of directors, and there are so many regulations. We spend so much time not figuring out how to make our business better, but how do we deal with all these pressures that we have from the government, reporting requirements, uh, all sorts of things that do not add any value, and they do not make us safer or make us better. They just maintain jobs with the bureaucracy, and the bureaucracy self-perpetuates itself. So my solution, it's not my solution, but a solution that I think it's, it's most effective is to eliminate the professional political class. We do not, you know, there are term limits for governors. There are term limits for mayor. No matter how great the governor is, no matter how great the mayor is, we recognize, no matter how great the president is, we recognize that having a change is good for our body politics. It's not the same thing for, for Congress. Congress is perpetual because we, they, they really need to know how to legislate. If they didn't know how to legislate, you know, everything will, will, would go, you know, bonkers. Well, that, that, I don't believe that's the case. I think we have a lot of very smart people and democracy in order to work has to, has to be uh, representative of the people, and it has to be rotational. There's only three examples in human history when people have ruled themselves where the legitimacy of governing has come from the approval uh, of the voters. And that's the Greek experiment, the Roman experiment, and our experiment. When the founding fathers founded America, 70% of humanity were either slaves or serfs. There were no democracies in the world. That was 250 years ago. Today, 50% of the world is democratic, and the other 50% go to the sham of, of elections to kind of claim that they have legitimacy from the governed. So we have succeeded in this. 
But as Ronald Reagan has said and many others have said, we are one generation away from tyranny. And I have lived under tyranny in Romania. I know what it is to live as a human slave in the 21st century. And the kind of technologies we have today make Orwell's 1984 possible. So we are very, very close. And when you look at the political discourse in this country, when you look at the media in general, they're just facilitating our move into that direction. So we got to put a stop. We got to reverse it. You know, we've been this, you know, at, at junctures like this before in our history. We, we you know, American people always rise up to the challenge. As uh, Winston Churchill said, one of my favorite quotes from Winston Churchill, Americans always do the right thing after they've exhausted all their alternatives. So uh, I, I believe in that, but I, I think we're, we're getting dangerously close to, to, to the edge of the cliff and uh, it doesn't mean that just because we, we, we bit the bullet a couple of times that this time, uh, this time it could be different. All right. Now, of course, you've changed the number of my questions already <laughs> with, with that answer. But um, from what you said, it sounds to me like you're a supporter of President Trump because he's a businessman and he got rid of a lot of the regulations. Um, is that accurate? I, I would say this much. President Trump is not on the ballot to represent the people of the 6th District. I'm running to represent the people of the 6th District of Massachusetts in Congress. Uh, I, I was talking to a friend of mine who actually was not a friend of Trump and explained to him a similar conversation we're having. And he said, you know, I think you're running on West Point values. I said, what do you mean, West Point values? He said, you know... The mission of West Point is to inspire and train leaders of character for the nations. And characters define us honesty, integrity, and courage. That's the way you've lived your life. And that's if, if I listen to your platform and what you want to achieve, that's what you want to achieve. My name is on the ballot, not President Trump, not the Republican Party. Yes, I'm running as a Republican because I believe in the fundamental values of the Republican Party. But I'm running to represent the best interests of the people of the 6th District and to represent the best interests and try to achieve the best interests of our society and of our country. Okay. You also talked a little bit about health care. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you mentioned that, because uh, it's expensive in this country, but people from all over the world come to this country to get treated, so the treatments must be pretty good. Um, so... What's wrong with the system that we have outside of the fact that it's expensive? And how can you fix the costs? Okay. So outside of the, the, the fact that it's expensive is, is the key issue. The fact that, and I totally agree with you, we have a great health care system. So if you can afford it, if you can have access to, to the, the great health care system, this is the best in the world. We should keep it. We should encourage it. But on the other hand, the cost is, is exorbitant, and it's exorbitant for, for what we get. So the, the way to, to fix the, the health care system is to um, uh, have, um, I, I lost my, my train of thought there, the, to, it, to basically there's a, there's a study that Professor Michael Porter, who's a university professor at Harvard Business School, has, has put out that basically suggests that the reason our healthcare system doesn't work is that it is designed to, to reward procedures as opposed to, the, to reward outcomes. And if we change the system to reward outcomes as opposed to uh, rewarding procedures, we can actually reduce the cost and, and, and improve outcomes for, for the whole society. And, and I'll just give you an example. Uh, Switzerland uh, ha has an insurance-based system. And in Switzerland, uh, the, um, um, the doctor and the patient negotiate, you know, based on certain parameters, uh, outcomes so in five years, if you have this much heart rate or whatever, uh, you will get half your insurance money back. So that's a, you know, a, a, a free market type system. And, and, and people then tend to take their health care a lot more seriously and, uh, you know, and... Uh, uh, provide better outcomes for the society. So, that, you know, I'm not an expert on health care. I don't think any congressman that tells you they're an expert, I mean, they're, 
the Obamacare bill is this big. I don't think, I doubt that any one congressman has read the Obamacare bill, you know. Uh, so w what you need to do in any enterprise is set standards, set objectives, and then let the expert uh, give you those objectives. And when we, sp when we spend twice as much money as anybody else for health care, that's a huge umbrella of inefficiency. And I tell you how that hurts the average American. I, 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 I've worked with a lot of companies, and I, I've, I've talked to CEOs, and they say to me, you know, we had a really great year this year, and I, and I, I cover all my people with health care, but I'm not giving anyone a raise this year or any bonus because my health care costs are going to go up 20 percent, 30 percent next year, and I want to make sure that everyone in, in the company is covered, so I'm going to put all that extra benefit in, into the healthcare system. So in, instead of going to the economy and, and you know, creating demand, it's going in, into, it's a transfer payment in, into the healthcare system. And, you know, the healthcare system is just inefficient. One third of all costs in the healthcare system is insurance costs. You, to manage the system efficiently, well, they're not managing the system efficiently by any, by any sort of metric. So, there's obviously room that, 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 that you can change it. Any business, when faced with being so uncompetitive, would benchmark itself against all its competitors, learn what they're doing better than you do, and then adjust. That's not the way we're approaching the healthcare system. We're giving us a, a binary choice, you know, uh, Medicare for all, single payer, or our current system. And uh, trying to make adjustments in between is, is it's very, very hard. All right. Now, you mentioned one thing that would be not helpful at all is a single-payer system. Right. Could you just explain what a single-payer system is? Because that's something that the liberals are really in favor of is a single-payer system. So let's tell the public what is the difference. Well, the, the single payer system basically, you know, if you look like England and uh, England's probably the best example because they've had it for a long time. And in England, very few people uh, go into medicine. They have to import their doctors generally from India, Pakistan, from, from their for, former colonies uh, because English, uh, English people uh, find, you know, that are competent and capable and could become doctors choose other professions because they, they could earn a lot more money because the salaries are, are, are capped and, and, uh, and work rules are, are pretty well established. And the government, there, there was a case recently where uh, uh, the, the English health system refused to allow a child because, you know, they did a calculation, uh, some health care. And Amer there were some American doctors and charities that were willing to bring that child to, for America for treatment. And... The healthcare system went to the courts to block that, you know, to protect their, the sanctity of their system. So you don't, you don't, you know, bureaucrats uh, are, are, you know, necessary evil in society, but they should be minimized to just essential functions. But bureaucrats, like like weeds, they like to grow and they like to expand their their reach. Uh, the last thing we need in our healthcare system is to turn it over to bureaucrats, and that's what single payer would do. Okay, now one other question on, on health care. Uh, a lot of people in this country get their medication from Canada mm -hmm. because it's less expensive than from this country. Um, my philosophy is mm -hmm. that the reason why it's so expensive in this country for certain meds is because of the research and development. And without research and development, you don't get the new medications. Uh, and our drug companies do an awful lot of that, and that's the part of the improvement. But why can you get medications in Canada for so much less if we develop them in this country? Because the, you know, the, again, it's the question of, I, I talked about insiders getting the benefits, because the insiders can control the American political system, and therefore, the, you know, What's politics? Who pays and who gets is the allocation of resources in society. That's the mechanism that, that we use to decide that. So uh, I'll just give you an example. Senator Cory Booker, the, the champion, the Spartacus of the people, 
Well, there, there was a, 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 a bill introduced a couple of years ago by Bernie Sanders with some uh, uh, support from a Republican, a bipartisan bill to allow basically that, to buy uh, medication from Canada. And, of course, the answer from the, uh, uh, from the pharmaceutical industry was, well, we don't know if they're safe, that the Canadians somehow may be taking drugs that aren't safe. And uh, Cory Booker voted against that bill. Because why? Because he's more a senator from Johnson & Johnson than he's a, a, a senator from the constituents of his district. He, he, he thinks he's the constituent will vote for him no matter what. But Johnson & Johnson may not support him, and that's far more important to him and his personal ambitions mm -hmm. than, than doing something right for, for, for the country and for the constituents, which is what Bernie Sanders and others. And when... Uh, uh, the current head of HHS was being interviewed for his job by, by the Senate, and uh, Senator Paul from uh, uh, Kentucky asked him, why, I, I, you, I'm not going to vote for you, he said, until you certify that you are actually going to test those drugs from Canada to show the world that they are safe. The reason that w we have this law is because the FDA is not testing those drugs, according to, to Senator Van Paul. So, um, so I think that there's a, there's a whole mechanism, a whole system that works to sustain this. So you ask why Americans are, are basically paying for the rest of the world to benefit? Uh, I would argue because the political, you know, the, the pharmaceutical companies have a lot, you know, have a lot more power in America than they do anything else. There are ten, there are nine or ten. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't want to be uh, misquoted, but there, I think nine or ten lobbyists, pharmaceutical lobbyists in Washington for every congressman. Yeah. Right. Let's switch gears a little bit, talk a little bit about foreign policy. A um, couple things. First of all, there's a big deal because th they say the Russians interfered in our elections. Okay. Why is it a problem for the Russians to interfere with our elections, but the United States interferes in other countries' elections, and that's okay. In other words, like, uh, under the Obama administration, the United States interfered in the Israeli election to try and defeat Netanyahu. Nobody talks about that. But if we can do it to other countries, why can't other countries do it to us, or should we eliminate that altogether? I would say that in, in the, there's a study out of Carnegie Mellon that uh, has indicated that the U.S., at least they were able to catalog the U.S. interference in something like 85 elections, or, or, you know, over the past couple of decades. Uh, there is uh, uh, there was a in very interesting article by, by Mr. Kinzer in the Boston Globe just a couple of weeks ago pointing out that the U.S. basically uh, got Boris Yeltsin re-elected in Russia because the, the alternatives were, were not uh, good, and uh, Boris Yeltsin was, had like 5 percent approval rating when we sent in our consultants. We, uh, we, we gave Russia $10 billion dollar, uh, loan from the IMF. So is, isn't that like talking from both sides of our mouth? And, and the, the point of the Kinzer arc, which I thought was, was kind of interesting, is that Boris Yeltsin could not, because he was uh, an alcoholic, could not finish his term. And he, he's the one that appointed uh, Putin as his successor. So to some extent, we are responsible for Putin being the current mm -hmm. president of, of Russia because, you know, the Clinton administration supported the, the uh, which at the time may have been the right political decision to make. Uh, that does not at all validate the allowing or allowing anyone, the Russians, the Chinese, any foreign e interest interfering in our election. But far worse than the interference in our election is the uh, influence that foreign governments buy in Washington. Right. You know, almost you know, almost every country, especially China, has former officials. There was a really good uh, episode on this on, on a show called The Next Revolution with Steve Hilton on, on Fox. And, you know, even 
both Dem former Democrats and former Republican officials working for the, for the government of Saudi Arabia, for the government of uh, uh, China, for, for UAE, for all sorts of foreign governments doing lobbying work for them. There, there was, he had one incident that Saudi Arabia gave some one of these consulting companies a, a contract of a million dollars, yeah. and in the same cycle, that company donated a million dollars to candidates. So, yeah. let, let me cut you off there because I have other questions. Sure. That, and we're running low on time okay. already. If you can't, if you can believe that, North Korea and Iran. Uh, where do you stand on those two? Well. Uh, I, I think the North Korea situation is going to be resolved, uh, hopefully in the best interest of, of the Korean Peninsula and stability in that part of the world. Uh, if I was a Kim Jong-un, I would just look and say, look, we have two people. Seventy-five years ago, the North Korea was actually more prosperous than the South. We followed two different paths. Today, South Korea has a standard of living that's 50 times better than the standard of living in North Korea. Let's look at what happened in Germany, after they, which was about four or five times difference, how they unified and what they benefited. And we, we can achieve the same things. And if we can co-opt the, the North Korean elites into making sure that they're not, there's not going to be retribution and, and all mm -hmm. sorts of things like that, I, I, I think we, we can have peace there. Iran, there is no choice but to put as much pressure as we can on that regime till that regime collapses of its own weight, just like we did with the Soviet Union. We defeated—we didn't defeat the Soviet Union collapsed upon itself, but that's because Ronald Reagan and the West stood, stood firm, and they bankrupted themselves. The, 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 in the Soviet Union, the net inputs into the, the, their economy, you know, all, all the, uh, the raw material, all the labor, etc., exceeded the value of the outputs. It was a totally corrupt, inefficient system, and it collapsed. And all we had to do was wait them out. I think North Korea is, is probably in the, in, in the same situation. A country would so they have, I, I believe, something in their GDP is one-sixth the sales of General Electric. Yeah. And yet they're pursuing nuclear enrichment and intercontinental ballistic missiles. You know, where do they get the resources for that? Okay, just very quickly, uh, the, the NAFTA situation right. with, with Trump saying no more NAFTA, we're going to renegotiate uh, free trade. You in favor of free trade? I am totally in favor of free trade, but I'm also in favor of changing. You know, we, we evolve in a certain uh, economic system of the last 70 years. It has served yes. humanity tremendously. The, the rate of poverty in 1946, people living on subsistence level was 60 percent. Today is 14 percent. Huge improvement. Yes. Look at education. Look, look at democracy. Look at freedom. Education, another mm. subject we didn't get to talk okay. about, but believe it or not, we are out of time already. All right. Well, that was, uh, this was a, <laughs> we need an hour for this okay. show. <laughs> Thank you. But, uh, good luck in the election. This Thank is you. Joe Schneider running for Congress in the 6th District, our district, and um, I hope this was informative for you. And uh, don't forget, first Tuesday in November, it's time to vote. Thanks for watching.